Welcome to the Someone Somewhere podcast. It's Sunday, March 22nd, and I'm your host, Nicole. This is episode 34. This episode is brought to you by Polycultured, our farm resources blog. We create informative content about a variety of topics, including organic agriculture, composting, seed saving, herbalism, permaculture strategies, and more. If you enjoy this content, please support us by going to www.patreon.com slash polycultured. I don't normally do current events on this podcast, but it seems like now is the time to share information that we have with one another. So episode 34 is going to be about herbal antivirals. Now this is a huge topic, of course, so I'm going to focus specifically on herbs that are meant to treat coronaviruses. In December, I read the book Herbal Antivirals by the renowned herbalist Stephen Harrod Buner, and I had originally picked up the book because in my fertility work, I get a lot of people who deal with the herpes simplex virus. So my intent was to read this book to gain a better understanding of the herbal regimens that could help treat HSV viruses, and there are a lot of great recommendations in there. But it turns out that this book has a wealth of information about most of the emerging viruses that are affecting human populations today. It mainly covers viral respiratory infections like influenza and coronaviruses like SARS, but it also has chapters on viral encephalitis like West Nile, cytomegalovirus, dengue, enterovirus, which is hand, foot, and mouth disease, Epstein-Barr, varicella zoster like chickenpox or shingles, herpes simplex, and gastrointestinal viruses like rotavirus and norovirus. As far as we know, the virus now known as COVID-19 started spreading in December, and by January I was compelled to share information from the book about what coronaviruses are, how the immune system reacts to them, and what herbal strategies as well as other best practices we can use to prevent the virus from attaching to our cells or treat the virus to prevent it from becoming deadly. I also have been listening to the guidance of other herbalists from different traditions. There's, of course, a wealth of knowledge that traditional Chinese medicine perspective brings, and there's also other traditions to look towards, like the Western herbalist perspective and Ayurveda. I'll do my best to explain what their recommendations are and how these approaches can be combined with medical approaches to act in synergy and potentially save lives. If you want to really get into depth on this topic, I suggest picking up the book from which much of the podcast is citing, and that's Herbal Antivirals by Stephen Howard Buner. Now, before we get started, I just want to make clear that if you're currently listening to this and you are sick, you absolutely should not attempt to treat the virus at home or without the help of medical professionals. As all ethical herbalists will tell you, we are not working against the medical world. We are working to improve its outcomes. We're here to offer support. We also need accurate data about this emerging virus, and so another reason to make sure you contact the proper medical establishments is so that you can be accurately accounted for. This virus can get serious very quickly, so do not delay in seeking medical treatment. These herbs are going to be most useful for someone who is either trying to prevent getting the viral infection or someone who has the infection but has been instructed by medical professionals to stay home and to heal from the sickness that occurs as a result of the viral infection. The information I am about to present is not a substitute for medical advice or medical care. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about some relevant information about viruses and viral infections. First, why would we utilize herbal antivirals? What would be the point of that and what is the advantage of doing so? Starting with the basics. Herbal antivirals, first, they don't cause resistance problems. They're biodegradable and renewable resources and they have less side effects and are generally safer to use by any person. Plants and fungi don't have legs. They actually predate legs as a concept by many, many years, but yet they survived. They did this because they are expert chemists. They're able to take in information and produce chemicals which are resistant to viral infection. As we see the rise of infectious disease caused by viral infection, We must take into account that we are more connected than ever before in the history of humanity, and this means viruses hitch a ride on a jet plane just like us. The hope with utilizing herbal antivirals is that we can see ourselves as part of the interdependent life on Earth, that we can start to view plants and fungi as our ancestors, which they undoubtedly are, and to continue the tradition of working with them to protect our species, as they have learned to do long before we ever existed. 
Right now, we're facing an unprecedented global pandemic, and I honestly can't believe that these words are even coming out of my mouth. The gravity of it can't be understated, but we must understand that viruses are not this scary alien being here to destroy everything in its path. That would be much more Hollywood, though. Viruses are essential to life on planet Earth. There is no avoiding them. There is no situation in which we're going to be able to kill them off, not without killing ourselves and the rest of the creatures here. Viruses perform important ecosystem functions, interweaving the genetics of all of the life forms on Earth. In this way, you could say that there is no boundary between any of us living things here. Our genetic code is inextricably linked to the environment around us. Viruses are discriminated against as life forms simply because they don't have cellular structure or use cellular division, but we should investigate this dismissal further. Simplistic, maybe, but viruses contain a strand of either DNA or RNA encapsulated by a polyhedron called a capsid. In the case of something like coronaviruses, which are called enveloped viruses, the capsid is surrounded by one or more multiple protein envelopes. They are highly intelligent beings. They enter cells and have the ability to intertwine the DNA or RNA of those cells into their own genetic structure. The protein envelope of viruses is covered with receptors. Yes, viruses have sensory apparatuses that allow them to survey the world around them and help them find the host cells that they're looking for. They can experiment with new combinations of genes to adapt to their environment. For these reasons, we may hopefully begin to start thinking of viruses as very much alive, to the chagrin of our high school science teachers. There are an estimated 10 to the 31st power viruses on Earth. They exist in the coldest and hottest places on Earth, in the deepest depths and the highest points in the atmosphere. Some of them are believed to even be in space, riding on comets and existing in places that we never could. DNA and RNA viruses are a little bit different. DNA viruses make copies of themselves that are pretty true to their original form, and we've been pretty successful at making vaccines for them because of this. RNA viruses, in contrast, make copies that are similar, but sometimes can vary widely from the original. RNA viruses increase their genetic variation in order to survive within their host, and this also allows them to masterfully evade treatment. This is why it is particularly difficult, one might even say impossible, to make a highly effective vaccine for an RNA virus. The sensory receptors are also aware when they encounter pharmaceuticals and are prone to resistance as they learn about the effects of the drugs. The same is true when an RNA virus encounters the human immune system. Viral copies that are most similar to one another will die off first, but the other copies will continue to multiply, like in the case of influenza, which regularly remixes its genetic structure and adds new genes to remain undetected. And this is why there's a new flu vaccine year after year, and why its rate of effectiveness is below half. The CDC reports 45% for 2019 to 2020. Viruses spread in a multitude of ways. Again, no legs means you can get pretty creative. Their genetics instruct them to stimulate ways for their host to continue their spread. For example, respiratory viruses tend to encourage sneezing and coughing of their host to continue the spread. Mosquito-borne viruses release chemicals into the skin that alerts other mosquitoes to feed off of this particular host. Tick-borne viruses use tick saliva to help their entry into the host and other complex systems of entry. Once a virus is inside the body, they're willing to use the body's own cells to get around the body until they settle on their preferred host cell. They're able to do so undetected through a chemical invisibility cloak, tricking the body and duping the immune response. Now that the virus has taxied a ride to its destination, it takes off its protein coat, literally, and gets comfortable. It's able to halt cellular death, break off a piece of itself, and enter the nucleus of the cell, where it replicates the virus. Then, viral budding occurs, where these particles leave the nucleus and the cell bursts apart, where it begins to look for new host cells. What are emerging pathogenic viruses, and how are they accomplishing their goals? We're living in a world that's very different from those of our ancestors. Our institutions, modes of transport, and our motivations have totally transformed in the last few centuries. Viruses are incredibly resilient because of their ability to adapt, through their ability to learn, and then apply that learning to their genetic rearrangements. 
Emerging pathogenic viruses are triggered by ecological disturbance and human intervention to jump species. The more we mess with the delicate balance of life through the destruction of habitat and therefore loss of host species, viruses that once lived in balance with wild animal hosts will find their way to livestock and eventually to us. Some of the disruptions we participate in include climate change, deforestation and destruction of plant populations, which leads to the extinction of several species in the ecological web, the pollution or destruction of waterways, industrial agriculture, industrial pharmaceuticals, medical concentration in hospitals and nursing homes, and population changes such as refugee crises, urbanization, population density, and of course daily, mass-scale, worldwide transport, most notably via air travel. As Buner remarks in his book, Epidemiologists have been warning with increasing insistence that a worldwide pandemic similar to the one that covered the globe in 1918, a pandemic that infected over 500 million people and caused some 100 million deaths, is due soon. And here we are. The 1918 world influenza pandemic was devastating. We should make an effort to understand why it was so particularly harmful. The answer is twofold. Around 1913, a new influenza strain had jumped from birds and split into two types, one infecting pigs and the other infecting humans. It continued mutating in the following years. Then in 1914, World War I began. By 1917, it had ended, sending soldiers back home on ships that docked in many ports, sharing the virus as the men disembarked. To put it in perspective, one out of every three people on Earth became ill, and one out of every five people on Earth died. Earth lost 5% of its human population due to this pandemic, and doctors and first responders were the first to die. Now I'm going to talk for a moment about influenza virus. Influenza is an enveloped RNA virus that prefers the lungs with three different groups, A, B, and C. Influenza A is the most dangerous of the three, and it's the one that was responsible for the 1918 pandemic. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the H1N1 virus. There are others that occurred in the 20th century, such as H2N2, H5N1 bird flu, but H1N1 reappeared in the swine flu pandemic of 2009 and was considered a descendant of the 1918 strain. Industrial agriculture is particularly impactful for influenza because the virus is able to pass through farm animals, mutate, and then pass itself back to us, usually through farm workers. And this is why you'll hear names related to birds or pigs like swine flu or avian flu. Influenza prefers to bind to sialic acid linkages on the surface of lung epithelial cells, where they can get inside. Once inside, the virus is able to evade the immune system, where it takes itself apart and releases its viral RNA and core proteins into the cytoplasm. It combines with other viral components and viral budding occurs, where new viruses move to new host cells and the process continues. You may be hearing quite a bit about cytokines in the news. Cytokines are physiological inflammatory signaling molecules produced by the body, intended to respond to bacterial or viral infection. Cytokines are meant to disrupt the conditions for viruses and bacteria to thrive. However, these pathogens have also learned strategies to get around this, using them for their own purposes and helping them to spread and survive. During the viral cellular infection and replication, the virus stimulates the release of cytokines. Cytokines make the cellular membranes and joints between the cells more porous, allowing for easier movement of the virus from cell to cell. They also stimulate the cytokines to suppress the part of the immune system that would attack them. The virus can use certain proteins to block the induction of certain types of cytokines called interferons, like type 1 interferon, as well as lowering the response levels of T and B cells of the immune system so that they can get established in the body. It's interesting to note here that it's not the virus itself which makes someone feel sick and experience symptoms. It's actually the body's response to infection via these cytokines. The mucus in your lungs during an influenza or coronavirus infection is actually an increased amount of white blood cell filled mucus stimulated by cytokines. This is called a cytokine cascade. Drainage lymph nodes in the lungs begin to increase to prevent suffocation, but can become overfull during severe infections. 
as well as becoming attacked or damaged during the infection. This means drainage is slowed or not functioning at all, and this is what can contribute to mortality with these respiratory viral infections. This is why some people report extreme difficulty breathing or the sensation of drowning. When cytokine cascades become cytokine storms, the death rate climbs, usually from acute respiratory distress, cardiac arrest, or organ failure. Cytokine storms don't necessarily mean that the virus replicates faster, but rather that the cytokine increases damage to the lungs and other affected organs. The inflammation, once concentrated to the area of infection, becomes body-wide, inducing sepsis. HMGB1 protein is also released when the nuclei of cells becomes damaged, sending white blood cells to the lungs, called neutrophil infiltration, and this causes inflammation and lung damage. As this progresses, respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation, acute renal failure, and systemic shock occur. During severe infections, reducing HMGB1 is essential. In this way, herbs that reduce the main cytokines that are specific to that viral infection, this will lessen disease severity and prevent lung damage. Herbs also have the potential to directly inhibit HMGB1 where steroid drugs and NSAIDs cannot. Now I'm going to talk about what is a coronavirus. Coronaviruses look structurally similar to influenza viruses as they are also enveloped viruses, but they are positive stranded RNA viruses possessing the largest genome of all RNA viruses and which engage in a high rate of RNA combinations, constantly producing new variations. There are about a dozen coronaviruses with just a few infecting people. SARS, Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome, is considered the most serious. The International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses announced in February that the virus would be called SARS-CoV-2 because the novel coronavirus is genetically related to the SARS coronavirus of 2003. The World Health Organization has called the same virus COVID-19 because of the unintended consequences in creating unnecessary fear for some populations. Both groups are in communication about the naming, and COVID-19 is not a replacement for the official name of SARS-CoV-2. For the purposes of this podcast, I will refer to the virus as SARS. It takes about a week to develop in the body and is primarily spread from respiratory droplets and contact with body secretions such as feces and urine, which shed viral particles for several weeks. Symptoms include fever, cough, difficulty breathing, headache, muscular stiffness and muscle pain, loss of appetite, chills, confusion and dizziness, rash, night sweats, nausea, and diarrhea. SARS attaches to angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, or ACE2. This is an essential membrane protein on many cells in the body, including the heart, vascular cells, and kidneys. ACE2 helps regulate the renin-angiotensin system, which is involved in many complex processes crucial to the functioning of the lungs, spleen, and lymph nodes. SARS viruses attach themselves to ACE2 on the surface of lung, lymph, and spleen epithelial cells, destroying their function. Once the infection starts, inflammatory cytokines are strongly upregulated. The primary cytokines upregulated are TNF-alpha and IL-6. Others include IFN-gamma, CXCL10, IL-1-beta, RANTES, MCP1, and IL-8. The P38 MAPK pathway is stimulated, causing prostaglandin E2 and TGF beta to rise. HMGB1 levels are also high, especially in those who die. It also replicates in dendritic cells, which lie just below the epithelium layers of the lung tissue. The effect of this is the inhibition of those dendritic cells to mature and produce active T cells of the immune system. So the virus causes severe cytokine cascades, which set off massive immune cell migration, infiltration, and accumulation into the lung tissues, ultimately resulting in lung damage and particularly the lymph nodes in the lungs, as well as the spleen. This is particularly concerning for the elderly who have a greater cytokine upregulation and increased mortality. Statistics from previous SARS viruses denote that the greatest mortality rates are in those over the age of 65, around 50%. 
and that those under the age of 24 are not very susceptible. This does not mean that you won't get the virus if you're young. It means that you're statistically more likely to survive it. This condition causes hypoxia to occur, where the body is deprived of adequate oxygen. Protecting the lungs from hypoxia reduces lung damage and increases the efficiency of oxygen utilization. This virus also specifically targets the ciliated cells of the lungs, destroying their ability to move mucus up and out of the lungs. Autoantibodies are produced from the autoimmune response to attack the body's own cells, increasing in the damage to these tissues. There are several medical treatments for coronaviruses that have been used in the past. Some of them include ribavirin, an antiviral medication used to treat hepatitis C and RSV viruses, corticosteroids meant to lower inflammation, indomethacin, an NSAID used to treat arthritis, remontadine, an antiviral medication used to treat influenza A, lopinavir, an HIV drug used during SARS-03, but not showing promising data to support its use for this virus, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. And Cuba has been using the molecule interferon alpha-2b as a medication to stop the virus's ability to block it in order to get established in the body, as discussed above in the section about cytokines. And that's pretty much all we've got from the medical world. So now I want to get into information about anti-SARS herbs and the SARS protocols that we have. The plants found specific to SARS virus are Chinese skullcap, Houtania, Isatis, Licorice, Forsythia suspensa, and Sophora flavensins. Let's start at the beginning. Blocking attachment to ACE2. Herbs indicated for blocking attachment include licorice, Chinese skullcap, luteolin, horse chestnut, Japanese knotweed, Chinese rhubarb, elder, and cinnamon. Kudzu, danshen, and ginkgo upregulate and protect ACE2 expression. ACE inhibitors such as kudzu and hawthorn increase the presence of ACE2 and protect the lungs from injury. Then there are herbs which can modulate or downregulate cytokines. We actually want to try to calm the immune response with herbs to prevent severe repercussions from the disease process. Dongkwai and astragalus lower TGF cytokine, which is strongly upregulated. Japanese knotweed, Chinese Seneca root, Chinese skullcap, cordyceps, kudzu, and boneset reduce IL-1 beta cytokine, decreasing disease impact and inhibiting mortality. Cilia protective herbs include cordyceps, olive oil and leaf, berberine plants like barberry and golden seal, and Spanish needle, Biden's pilosa. Rhodiola specifically prevents hypoxia-induced oxidative damage as well as reducing the autoimmune response. Other autoimmune response calming herbs include astragalus and cordyceps. Japanese knotweed protects endothelial cells. Herbs that protect the lymph and spleen, such as red root, poke root, and Chinese skullcap are also indicated. Herbs that stimulate dendritic cell maturation, like cordyceps, and those that increase T cell counts, like licorice, red root, elder, and zinc, are also helpful. Fresh ginger juice, or hot ginger juice tea, is also potently antiviral, and thins mucus, helping to protect mucous membranes from damage and acting as a diaphoretic or increasing perspiration to lower fever during infection. Shuang Huang Lian is an herbal formula of Chinese medicine that may be indicated for SARS-CoV-2. It consists of two parts for Cynthia suspense fruit, one part Japanese honeysuckle stem and flowers, one part Chinese skullcap root, with a dosage of one teaspoon three times daily. There are also three other formulations I want to share with you that were recommended from Stephen Hard Buner. The core formulation, which is three parts Chinese skullcap root, one part Japanese knotweed root, two parts puaria, one part licorice root, one part decocted elder leaf. And the dosage for this is one teaspoon three times daily, or if infected, one teaspoon six times daily. The immune formulation is three parts cordyceps, two parts donkwai, one part rhodiola, one part astragalus. The dosage is also one teaspoon three times daily, 
or if infected, one teaspoon six times daily. And the last formula is cellular protection or cytokine modulation, as well as spleen lymph support. Three parts Dan Shen, two parts California Lilac, one part Biden Spilosa. And the dosage is the same, one teaspoon three times daily. If infected, one teaspoon six times daily. As we learn more about the specifics of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, I'm sure more formulations will surface. Having at least some of the herbs on hand in tincture or even dried form for teas can be extremely helpful as the medical community is already overtaxed. Many people will be turned away from hospitals and asked to ride this out at home. For people who fall into that criteria, these herbs can be essential to healing without having to seek further medical attention. For those who are still healthy and haven't become infected, this can be essential for preventing the virus from being able to enter and attack your cells. Now, for those of you that don't know how to make a tincture, I'm going to give you a crash course right now in case you have the ability to order these herbs but don't have any clue on how to tincture something because it's really not all that hard. All herbs have a rainbow of chemicals. Some of those chemicals are alcohol soluble, some are water soluble, and others are oil soluble, like what's found in cannabis, for example. In order to get a maximum spectrum of phytochemicals, I recommend to always double extract your tincture in both water and alcohol. Start by taking one part herb medium that you have and add four parts filtered water. Boil the contents for at least 30 minutes. If you have time, let the herbs steep overnight. Then strain the liquid. What you've made is called an infusion, or if you left to steep overnight, a decoction. Then you're going to take the one part herb medium, blend in a blender to fine or chop up the ingredient, and place it in a tincturing jar like a mason jar, for example. Then add four parts alcohol, so it's still the one to four again. Then you're going to take that decoction water liquid that you made and add it back to the alcohol. So now you should have one to one ratio of alcohol and water along with the herb medium itself in the jar. Now you're going to want to shake the jar daily for at least two weeks, but six weeks is best for it to mature. In the emergency situation, such as the one that we find ourselves in, you can begin taking the tincture as soon as you can, leaving the medium in the mixture to increase the chemical extraction as time goes on. So there you have it. I've gone over why we would use herbal antivirals, what viruses are and the threat of emerging pathogenic viruses. I talked about influenza, cytokine cascades and cytokine storms, coronaviruses, and the herbal protocols best indicated for combating them. The main strategies here that we want to block attachment to ACE2, reduce the strong effects from cytokines, and protect the lungs from damage. I hope this podcast finds you well and that you can use this information to protect yourself and your community. We don't know what the next weeks will bring, but the West is sorely lacking in information about earth medicine that's useful for this pathogen. Right now is a really good time to start learning about how these medicines are useful and to continue creating decentralized networks where we can provide access to them at low to no cost. I've made my own blend based off of the recommendations above, and I encourage you to do the same. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please like, subscribe, and comment to let me know how I'm doing. This episode is brought to you by Polycultured, our farm resources blog. We're bringing you info on backyard food production and sustainable living on small plots and in urban areas, as well as information about herbal antivirals and other earth medicines. If you enjoy this content, please support us by going to www.patreon.com slash polycultured. This concludes episode 34 of the Someone Somewhere podcast. Good night.